Uh, yeah, it's our first time here in, in the Simons uh, Foundation. It's a nice, this is quite a nice uh, location. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about um, some work that I did about uh, two years ago um, in combinatorics. Um, it's a purely, it, it, it's a pure math problem, not really motivated by applications. Well, it's motivated by applications to other areas of mathematics, but not so much outside mathematics. Um, but uh, um, it turned out to have a really nice solution and connect to, to many more parts of mathematics than, than we first thought. Um, and so it's in an area of mathematics called discrepancy theory. Um, so uh, to motivate the subject of, of discrepancy theory, um, um, uh, I mean, the problem I'm talking about is not really about applications, but just sort of to motivate the, the general area. Um, so whenever you, you, you uh, uh, nowadays you want to run up an algorithm, um, some sort of computer science algorithm, um, often you, you, um, you need some sort of random input. Um, many, many, uh, many algorithms run, um, require some sort of random number generation. So a very simple example is that maybe, um, suppose you have a, so the square is, is not displayed, but suppose you have a square, say a unit square, area one, and you have some region inside the square, and you want to compute its, its area. Okay, so um, if you have the formula for the curve, you can tr maybe try calculus. Uh, you can try to split up the curve in, in, into squares and, 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 and count it. But um, in some cases, this may, this may not be very uh, practical. But there is a, a very uh, simple algorithm to estimate the area of, of a region like this, uh, which is called Monte Carlo uh, uh, integration. Um, so what you can do, so here's a square, and you have this region. You can just start selecting random points. Okay, so so you, you select, say, 100 random points in your square, and you count what proportion of those points lie in, this, in, uh, in, in your region. And whatever that proportion is, that would be some estimate for the, uh, for the area of this region. So if, for example, 60 of, the, of these 100 points lie in this region, then you might think that the, uh, uh, you would estimate the area of this region to be about 60% uh, of the area of the square. Okay, so this is the Monte Carlo method. Um, and uh, um, so it's, it's, it's very fast, um, but uh, it may not be very accurate. Okay, um, and the reason it's not very accurate is because these random dots are not um, spread out in, 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 they're not necessarily spread out in, in the best way. Y you can see in this picture that, that like there's, there's big regions of space that are, are not covered at all by, uh, uh, by these dots, and there are some regions in which there, there, there are too many dots. Uh, so um, some, some portions may be oversampled, some may be undersampled. Um, and uh, that's just a feature of randomness. If you select random sequences, you will get some clustering in, in, in some locations and big empty spaces in other locations. So what you would like is um, to replace a random sequence. Instead of using a random sequence, um, it would be better to pick um, a more carefully chosen sequence which is um, more uniformly distributed than, than a random sequence. That avoids clustering. Okay? So you could think maybe I could just do a grid. You know, maybe you could you could pick the points uh, on a regular grid, um, and that's not a bad choice. But um, but grids have their own artifacts. You know, like if, if if you choose your your points on a grid, then if your if your region is like a square, which is just uh, a little bit off um, off center from 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 the grid points, um, you, you can get a, you can get a um, you can overcount or undercount your um, uh, uh, your. Uh, uh, your, est your estimate that way. So you don't want to use a, a, a perfect grid. You want some other choice of points which is very well distributed. No matter what kind of set you, uh, you, you, you plonk down, um, you would like um, your, num your set of points to always have sort of about the right number of, of points in that grid. Okay, so the, the technical term for that is that you want to find a sequence of low discrepancy. Um, so the uh, the discrepancy of of a, of a set of points roughly is 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 uh, you given any region you count how many points there are in that region you you compare it against the area of that region and 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 you want the difference the discrepancy between them to be as small as possible, and so you want to create you want to create uh, sets of points which which have very low discrepancy, um, and those are better than random sequences uh, they're called subrandom sequences, um, and and they're very useful in applications. Okay. Now, having said all that, uh, we're actually not going to see, uh, we're not going to, to do any of that. Um, so, I mean, th th that's sort of the main motivation for discrepancy theory. Um, but we are not, um, yeah, but the, the, the problem, uh, the specific problem in discrepancy theory we're talking about uh, does not have direct application to, to things like Monte Carlo uh, integration, but uh, this was just served as uh, some sort of abstract motivation. 
Now, um, I, was, I gave you an example of a two-dimensional sequence. So the, um, okay, so Monte Carlo integration can be done in two dimensions, in three dimensions, in any dimension. Uh, but now, now let's, let's go to just one dimension and um, present a simpler sort of discrepancy problem which, in which you can't draw as many nice pictures, but um, just a discrepancy problem of one-dimensional sequences. So th um, this is the, the, the question, uh, this is the setting that Erdrich's problem came from. Okay, so now let's just consider a sequence um, of, um, okay, so in, in, instead of a, a random sequence of points, we're just going to consider a, a random sequence of signs, plus or minus ones. So consider a sequence of signs, plus one, minus one, plus one, plus one, and so forth, something like that. So, so this, this is called a sign pattern, or sign sequence. Okay, so if you choose signs randomly, like if you flip a coin, heads, heads is plus one, tails is minus one, you keep flipping coins to create a random sequence, it will fluctuate plus or minus one, and in any given, if you take any given interval in, in, this, in, this, uh, in, in this sequence, you would expect half the time you get a plus one, half the time minus one, so there should be 50-50 split. But it won't be exactly 50-50 split. There'll, there'll, be there'll, there'll be some discrepancy. You know, there'll, there'll be some intervals where there's slightly more pluses and minuses, and there's some intervals where there's slightly um, fewer pluses and minuses. Um, but on the whole, they'd be almost balanced. So uh, in particular, if you sum the sequence, if, if, you, if you consider sums of the sequence on some range, uh, you, sh you should get a lot of cancellation. For example, if you sum the first six elements of the sequence, so if you take the first six elements of the sequence, the sum could range anywhere from plus six to minus six, but in this particular case, it, it actually sums to zero because there are three plus ones and three minus ones, so everything cancels out perfectly. So this sequence has no discrepancy on the interval length six, but on the interval length five, there, is, uh, there will be a discrepancy. I think it's uh, three plus ones and two minus ones, so it's a plus one discrepancy. So a basic question in the subject is, uh, you know, can you design sequences whose discrepancy is as, is as small as possible? Um, and it depends on exactly what you mean by discrepancy. Um, and depending on what you mean by discrepancy, this problem could be either very easy or it could be very hard. Um, so let's start with a, uh, a very easy question first. Okay. So suppose by discrepancy, we just mean we want the partial sum, the, the, um, the um, initial sums to be small. So um, the model problem is this. So, so um, suppose you have, say, a finite sequence of, of, of uh, plus or minus ones, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. And you just, you just want to make the, um, the partial sum small. So you, you want to make the, the, the first element small, the sum of the first two elements small, the, the sum of the first three elements small. You just want your sequence to be balanced um, 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 on, on every, um, the first n elements to, to, be, to, be, to, to always be small. Okay? So, you, you, um, so this is how we're going to define what it means to be low discrepancy. Um, so this is a fairly easy question. Okay, now, you, you could uh, just choose the signs randomly, like we did with the Monte Carlo uh, method, but that's not such a great uh, choice. If, if, you, if you choose n numbers randomly, um, then there are standard results in probability, um, in particular something called the Chernoff inequality, uh, that will tell you that the, um, um, uh, that the sum of the first n, if you take n random signs and you add them together, the sum will be about as big as square root of n, which can get pretty big. So if you add like one million, if a sequence of length one million, the random fluctuations will be of size about 1,000. But you can do much better than that, okay? And in this particular case, it's actually quite easy to see what to do. If you just pick your sequence to be alternating, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, then um, all your partial sums will either be one or zero. Like the, the sum of the first element is one, the sum of the first two elements is zero, one, zero. You will never get any fluctuation beyond one and zero. And that's, of course, the best you can do. Um, and so this, 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 this is, your, um, this is the, the lowest discrepancy sequence you can make, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. Okay, so that's pretty obvious. Um, you know, and okay, I hesitate to call it an application, but you know, for example, you know, like like when 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 you row, okay, when you have people who uh, when you, when you have you know eight, four or eight people rowing a boat, you know, the, the rows are the, the oars are alternating back and forth, and one of the reasons for that is is to keep the discrepancy low so that you you know the, 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 the it doesn't it doesn't wobble, but okay, that's of course they weren't thinking in those terms when they, but um, yeah, if you if you put the oars randomly, then then you would get a, a lot more fluctuation. Okay, so that, that was an easy question. Um, so uh, a harder question is, um, so suppose you don't just want the first, uh, uh, the partial sums to be small, but suppose you, you also want um, the, uh, the sums on, on over any arithmetic progression to be small. So you, you, you have your, your sequence of signs, F1, F2, F3, and so forth, and you don't just want f1, f1 plus f2, f1 plus f2 plus f3 to be small, but also you want, say, f3 plus f3 
5 plus F7 plus F8, uh, F9 to be small. So you want, you, you want to have low discrepancy not just on initial segments, but on every single ethnic progression. You know? so, so now picking an alternating sequence would be, would be a very bad idea, because uh, if you look at the even numbers, uh, if every second uh, on the sequence, you just get all plus ones or all minus ones, and you get a huge discrepancy. So you, you now want a sequence that, that oscillates, but also avoids somehow, um, uh, also oscillates on arithmetic progressions as well. OK. Now, again, if you, if you have a big, long sequence of, say, a million um, numbers, and you do this randomly, then probability theory will tell you that your, your average fluctuation you expect is about a square root of n, which can get pretty big. Um, and so the, the question is, can you, do, can you do better? Is there some nice choice of sequence which actually fluctuates um, uh, um, a lot less than, than, than a random sequence? Okay, so now the alternating sequence doesn't work. Um, and there's, now there's actually some limitation. There's, there's a limit as to how, how good you can make your sequence. Um, so there's a, um, there's a classical theorem in mathematics uh, called Van der Waarden's theorem. Um, and it's a theorem in combinatorics about colors. Um, the, theorem, the, the statement of the theorem is the following, that if you take all the numbers in the world, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so forth, and you color them in different colors, let's say red and, and blue, um, then no matter how you color um, these colors, uh, the numbers in, into, into colors, as long as you only use finitely many colors, um, one of the colors must contain lots and lots of arithmetic progressions, must contain progressions of any length. So for example, um, here we, we color the numbers from one to nine in blue and red, uh, and we see that there is a, a, a uh, red progression of, of length three. Okay, so, so here the numbers three, six, and nine are all red, and they are form a progression of length three. Um, if you change this red to a blue, um, then you no longer have a red progression of length three, but, 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 uh, but you have created a blue progression of length three. And as you, as you take more and more numbers, uh, Van der Waarden's theorem tells you that, that you must have uh, single color progressions uh, of longer and longer length. Okay, so this is one of the um, the first theorems in what's called Ramsey theory, which is a subfield of com combinatorics. Um, but anyway, as a consequence of this theorem, the, um, this shows that, that, that any sequence uh, of plus and minus ones must have um, unbounded discrepancy as, as, you, as, you go to, uh, as you make the length of the sequence go to infinity uh, if you uh, are measuring discrepancy along all arithmetic progressions. See, because if you have a sign pattern of plus and minus ones, you can think of that as coloring the images in, into, into two colors, the plus one color and the minus one color. And uh, Van der Waarden's theorem tells you that one of these colors will have lots and lots of arithmetic progressions. And so there'll be one progression where everybody's plus one, or one progression where everyone's minus one. And th this will create, uh, this will create um, unbounded discrepancy. OK, so, um, so unlike the, the simple situation partial sums, the discrepancy must eventually grow. Um, now, if you're an analyst and you are told that something grows to infinity, you, you, you are naturally, the next question is, how fast does it go to infinity? Um, and so, in fact, um, there was a theorem of, of, uh, of Roth. Um, so Roth is known for many things. So he, uh, I think he, in his Fields Medal Citation, you know, the, like three results mentioned, and this was his th the third one in his, uh, uh, this maybe his third most important theorem. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so he showed, in fact, that if, um, if you take uh, a sequence of length n uh, and you measure discrepancy along arithmetic progressions, the discrepancy must be at least as big as basically uh, the fourth root of n times a constant. So the random example gives you square root of n, and, um, uh, but uh, um, he showed that, that, uh, that you can do a bit better than square root, but you can't do better than the fourth root. Okay, so that turns out to be the, uh, the order of growth. Uh, much later, in 96, uh, Matushik and Spencer um, um, showed that, in fact, uh, there do exist sequences where the discrepancy is, uh, is, is of, uh, of this order, that... Uh, that uh, um, that you can find sequences which, which, which have discrepancy in one fourth. Although the funny thing is that their, their, their proof is, is non constructive. So we do, I can't actually tell you exactly what sequences do this, but we know that they exist. Anyway, so the, uh, the Erdős problem is sort of in between. Okay, so if, 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 you, if you sum only the initial segments, then it's an easy problem that uh, the discrepancy is always bounded. If you use every single arithmetic progression, then the discrepancy must be unbounded. Um, and so the problem of Erdős was to consider something um, sort of halfway in between these two questions, where you're not allowed to use all arithmetic progressions, but you're only allowed to use what are called homogeneous arithmetic progressions. So homogeneous arithmetic progressions, um, 
they start at the, at the same, um, um, their skip is the same size, as, as, as the same value as their starting position. So like 10, 20, 30, 40 is a homogeneous arithmetic regression, or, or, uh, or 3, 6, 9, um, 12. Okay, so, you know, my daughter's actually six. She's just learning skip counting, so, so she's doing this actually every day. <laughs> you know, homework, okay. She's learning, learning all, you know, she's basically writing down all these uh, homogeneous arithmetic regressions. Okay. <laughs> Um, not, not for this problem, though. Okay, but um, <laughs> anyway, so um, you, okay, so if you only look at, at these special progressions, and you ask, okay, so I can't make my sequence bounded on every single arithmetic progression, but if I restrict attention to just these special progressions, now can I make the sequence bounded? Okay, um, so this may seem like a random question, but uh, the funny thing about Erdős, so Erdős is uh, was famous for posing literally thousands of, of math questions, and and you know, on, on some level, anyone can, can pose thousands of math questions. But but Erdős somehow he, he 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 had a knack of posing questions which which had interesting answers. <laughs> you know, they, they weren't sort of obviously true, obviously false. But you, but you had so, something interesting had to be done to solve them. Um, anyway, yeah. So um, yeah. So Erdős asked, is it possible to find a sequence of plus minus ones which have which stay whose sums stay bounded along every single one of, of these of, of these progressions? So no matter whether you count by threes or count by fives or count by tens, the, the sums always stay bounded. Okay. Um, so, um, and he had, he had reasons for this. Okay, so, so um, in, in fact, in his original paper where, where he mentioned this, he's, he was motivated by, by uh, connections with number theory, which I'll talk about later. But you can think of this as a purely combinatorial question. Um, Okay, so another way of thinking about it, in, um, so rather than talk about infinite sequences, there's an equivalent formulation for finite sequences. So another way of saying it is, is that given any threshold C, um, does there exist, uh, and if you, if you make your sequence long enough, is it necessarily the case that, that, that any sequence of plus minus ones, eventually um, you have to find that it, any sign, sign pattern of length n must contain a, um, a progression of, uh, uh, in which the sum is, is at least C. Um, Maybe I, I, uh, I didn't plan to do this, but um, th there's a there's a YouTube blogger uh, who who does ma math blogs, and I, I've, I've forgotten his his name. Um, okay, I don't know his name, but his, his YouTube handle has like a banana in it, but I forgot exactly the precise. Um, but uh, he had he he blogged about this this question actually, and he had this nice formulation, which maybe I will I will state here. Um, so. Um, one way to think about this question is that uh, you know, s suppose you've, you've, been cap you've been captured by some sadistic torturer, um, and you're, you're now trapped in this one-dimensional region of space here. Okay, and so you're stuck at, at, at the origin here. And um, I think in, in, his, in his puzzle, um, if you go too far to the right, there's, there's maybe some, some cliff, you know, you, there's, you'll have instant death, okay, if you, if you go too far to the right. And also, I think he, he put a snake or something here. Um, and I can't draw a snake, but, um, okay. But, um, okay, so th there's some threshold C, which in this case is two, okay? And, and if you move to, um, two steps to the right or two steps to the left, uh, you will die, okay? Um, and uh, you have to give the, um, the torturer a sequence of, of steps. You have to give them, maybe say, 12 steps. You, know, you say right, left, uh, left, right, okay. You have to give some sequence of, of, of steps, and then he will, um, he will force you to take those steps. Um, now, if, okay, but not necessarily in order, okay? So if it was just in order, you could just go, just go right, left, right, left, right, left, okay? okay and you would, never, you would never fall off. But, uh, but your torturer will, will either read off the steps in order, or he will take every second step, or he will take every third step. Um, and one of the, t okay, and he will choose which one. Okay, so in, 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 in this case, actually, you're in trouble because if he takes every third step, so he'll, if, if you give him this sequence, he will say, he will say I'm going to count by threes and then go left, left, okay, and you will die. And um, so his formulation of the puzzle uh, was, uh, is there some way to, 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 to form a sequence so that, that you, you will always live no matter what the, the torture will say? Okay, so, uh, okay, so a colorful way of thinking about this question, if you, uh, all right. Okay, so um, all right, so um, you can phrase this question for, for many for different values of c, and the question gets harder and harder as c gets bigger. So, uh, for example, when c is one, is easy. Um, yeah, you die um, <laughs> basically. Okay, yeah, if you die, yeah, okay, 
if, if, uh, yeah, if, if C is 1, then the moment you take one step, no matter what you do, okay, you're, you're dead. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so if C is 1, then, then, then every sequence will just come to C at least 1, as long as you have at least one, one, one element. Okay, so, so 1 is a trivial case. Okay. So uh, the first interesting case is 2. Okay. So for two, you can, you can survive um, for some period of time. So it, it turns out that there's a length 11 sequence. So, so I guess in, in this language, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, left, right, left. Um, and y you can check, actually, that, that no matter what you do, uh, no matter what the torturer chooses, uh, y you will live. You will always stay in, inside, inside this range here. So, um, so there's a length 11 sequence where the discrepancy uh, along hom homogeneous ethnic regressions is, is exactly one. Um, but that's it. Okay, uh, the moment the, you're asked to, to give 12 steps and not 11, uh, you are dead. Um, and so maybe I'll give a little proof of this. <coughs> so um, the proof actually is very re reminiscent of um, solving a Sudoku puzzle. Um, and actually, this, this actually was an important remark. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll get to later, actually. Um, but... Um, Okay, so, 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 so why is this the case? Okay, so we prove our contradiction. Okay, so suppose, um, okay, so suppose th that you are able to produce a length 12 sequence in which the discrepancy is always one, that, that, that you will never die. Um, uh, you'll never go two, more than two steps left or right. Okay, so, we, we, okay, so what your sequence is, So we have basically 12 numbers, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 1, uh, with the property that no matter what, uh, how you skip count, the, the, the sums are always um, never reach plus 2 or minus 2. Okay, so the first number is plus or minus 1, and it doesn't really matter which one it is. Um, if it's minus 1, we can flip, we can, we can flip the entire sequence. So without loss of generality, we can assume that the, um, you start with plus 1. It doesn't really matter. Okay, now if you start with plus 1, um, the second term has to be a minus 1 if you want to live. Okay, because if you pick two plus ones in a row, okay, the torture will just uh, count by ones, and then, and then, and then you're dead. Um, now, three right now, we, we, we don't know yet. You can go either way. But uh, once you fix two, four is determined. So if, 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 um, if you go left minus one at, 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 at step two, you must go, go to plus one at, at, at time four, because otherwise, if it's minus one minus one, um, you skip by twos, and then you, you're, gonna, you're going to have a... Um, this comes with two, okay, and uh, and again plus one will give you minus one at eight for the same reason. Okay, now I can tell you what you have to do at three. Um, if you if you choose to go plus one at three, uh, you will be toast by time four because minus one plus one sorry plus one minus one plus one plus one is two. So you have to be minus one here. So, okay, it really is like filling in uh, the um, uh, um, um, the squares of a Sudoku, Sudoku puzzle. Okay, so once you're minus one here, uh, I think six has to be plus one because otherwise you count by threes, so you'd be in trouble. Uh, and plus one, this has to be minus one here. Um, if this is plus one, uh, this has to be uh, minus one to counterbalance. Because if it's plus one, uh, you would actually add, end up with plus two over here. Uh, this has to be plus one for a very similar reason. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, if this is minus one, this has to be plus one. Okay, because you count by fives. Uh, if this is plus one, um, I think this has to be minus one. Uh, you know, make the whole thing summed. Uh, yeah. Uh, otherwise, the whole thing. If it was plus one, you can. This whole thing was summed to two. And I think now. Okay. And then you will die, <laughs> because uh, if you if you count by threes, plus one, minus one, minus one, minus one kills you. Okay. So um, it was basically solving the Sudoku puzzle. Um, in computer science language, what we're doing here is we're solving what's called a two sat problem. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's all these, uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're trying to rule out certain combinations of, of signs and, and seeing whether you can still find a, a solution. Okay, so, okay, so this you can do by hand. Um, but things get a lot harder if you go one more step. So if, 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 you, if you're given one more um, degree of wiggle room, then things get a lot harder. So, uh, yeah, so... Um, you can ask, you know, now suppose you have three steps in, in either direction, can you, uh, uh, can you survive indefinitely? So um, this was only answered in 2014. 
So in 2014, uh, two computer scientists, Kornivno and Lusitsa, uh, they did two things. So first of all, um, they found a sequence of length 1,160, where the discrepancy was always um, um, bounded by two. So there's a big, long sequence of, of, of signs. In fact, I think I have it on the next slide. I'll show you. There it is. Um, that if you choose this particular sequence, um, then no matter what your torture does, you will, you will, your, your sums will never get uh, bigger than plus two or minus two. So you, you will live. OK, so that was already um, remar remarkable. I mean, if you pick a random sequence, you, you, will, you, you will die very quickly. OK, but, but, you, but you can live for time for length 1160. Um, but the more impressive thing they showed was that this, this was the optimal one, that if you take any sequence of length 1161, then you must, um, then there will be somewhere there will be a uh, um, homogeneous progression where your discrepancy is bigger than three, uh, three or bigger. Um, so this, um, this is now what's essentially what's called, what's called a, a three-sat problem. Um, and uh, those of you who know computer science, you know that three-sat problems are much harder than two-sat problems. You know, so so this, this, this little two-sat thing here, I, I could do on the board. I cannot do this on the board. Um, uh, so in, in fact, you know, so th this was computer-assisted. Um, and in fact, the certificate, so they, they produced this, this massive file that, that verified the computation. Um, and um, at the time, that file was actually the biggest, um, well, it, it held a record for the, the biggest mathematical proof in existence. Um, so the, the file was 13 gigabytes long um, uh, in, in size. It was, it, was a, it was described in the media as, as a proof bigger than Wikipedia, which apparently is not the standard unit of size. Okay. Um, <laughs> <coughs> it used to be libraries of Congress in my day, but okay. Um, okay, it's, it, it no longer has this record uh, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, they, they later simplified the proof, so it's only 850 megabytes. Um, but, but secondly, there's a completely different problem which, which actually required a 200 terabyte certificate. Um, so, okay, it's no longer the, the longest mathematical proof, but, uh, but it did have that record briefly. Okay, so that was three, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, and until this result, there was, it was not known whether there were unbounded sequences. You know, um, people, um, it was not known whether you could just go on forever without ever having to have discrepancy bigger than, than two. Okay, so that's three. What about and this is your sequence? Okay, what about four? Okay, so uh, kind of sits. A, they also found a, um, a very long sequence, which I'm not going to display here. It's now thirteen thousand nine hundred. So there was a now extremely long sequence, where all the partial sums along all the uh, progression, homogeneous progressions never get bigger than plus or minus four. Okay, but uh, they, did, they didn't know whether th this was the best. Um, okay, there was a four-set problem which, they were, which they had no computer really can solve at this point. Um, yeah, that, that th th um, and uh, yeah, so they, they don't, they, this is just the record, but, but uh, until like uh, two years ago, um, for all we knew, uh, there was like four, um, um, it, it might be possible to actually never reach four. Okay, there might actually be some infinite sequence where the discrepancy never exceeds four. Okay. So um, anyway, so that's what I, I managed to show. Actually, is is uh, the proof that uh, that in fact um, this, the discrepancies do get unbounded. That uh, yeah, that that for you know. So eventually, your discrepancy will, will exceed four, and then eventually it will exceed five, and it eventually exceed exceed six, and so forth. Now, okay. Now, there's no way that you can do this by by any of all these sort of uh, three sat, four sat type type computer calculations. So, so this is this is a, a theoretical result instead. Um, yeah. So, th the problem is very combinatorial in nature. Like, you know, it's very visibly uh, sort of a combinatorics problem. But it, it turns out that in order to, to to solve this question, you need tools from other areas of uh, of, of mathematics, in particular number theory and information theory. Um, and in particular, actually, um, the, the problem couldn't have been solved before 2015 because it needed an, a breakthrough in number theory, which was not available until 2015. Um, right. Yeah, so to understand sort of where the difficulty is coming from, so it, it's always important to sort of know what the enemy is. Um, and um, in particular, the, the enemy is going to be sequences that, that have very low discrepancy, but not quite bounded. And you, you know what, what sequences are sort of almost going to to uh, uh, to, to 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 disprove your theorem? Right? What what what, what's, what sequences are, uh, are going to almost have bounded discrepancy? Um, so it's it's not the random sequence. If you take a random sequence of length n, the discrepancy will be by square root of n, which is really big. You know, it's like if you take a sequence of thirteen thousand elements, the, the the discrepancy will be about a hundred. Okay, okay. If you want a, a sequence of two, three or four, um, you really have to pick a very very special sequence. 
So this is, this is something which, which was already noticed by Connors and Lissitz and by several other people, and actually by Erdős too, that, uh, um, okay, the, the best sequences, the sequences that come closest to disproving um, the, the, uh, um, the Erdős problem are sequences from number theory called multiplicative sequences. And um, a good example of a number theoretic sequence like this is something called the Louisville function. So the Louisville function is a, is a specific pattern of plus and minus ones, um, and it's, it's defined in terms of primes. Um, so it's, uh, it has a funny definition if you're not from number theory. I mean, it's, it's very natural if you, if you come from the subject, but it's, it's either plus or minus one depending on whether you have an even number of, or odd number of primes in your factorization. So for example, um, six is two times three, that's two primes, so uh, that's an even number. So, that's so the Louisville function lambda of six uh, um, is plus one, or I say 30 is two times three times five, so product of three primes has an odd number, so that, that gives you um, minus one. Okay, so it's sometimes plus one, sometimes it's minus one. And it fluctuates very, very randomly. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an important sequence in, in number theory. Um, but the, uh, the important thing about this sequence is that it's, it's what's called completely multiplicative, which I guess I, I didn't define here. All right. So maybe first of all, I'll tell you what this is. Okay, so the sequence looks like this. Plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, um, plus one. Minus one, minus one. Okay, so it, it, it fluctuates up and down, um, but the, the um, it has, it has an important property that most sequences don't have. It's it's, it's what's called completely multiplicative. So if you multiply two numbers together, like say three and four, uh, the product, the, the value of your number at the product is the product of the of the, your value at, at either two factors, uh, which is fairly obvious from the definition. But this 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 is uh, a key property of this um, of the sequence. Now, the reason why this is relevant is that if you're trying to sum this sequence on, on some progression, like if, if you wanted to, to if, you, if you count by, say, fives, okay, then because of this property, you can just, you can just factor out, uh, 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 this is just lambda of five times lambda of one, lambda of five times lambda of two. Okay, so, this sum here is, is either is plus or minus the, the same as this sum here. So for, for this particular series, um, um, skip counting does, doesn't, uh, doesn't help the torture at all. Okay? That, that it, it, will, it will give you, um, if you can already survive just ordinary counting, um, just um, counting, counting by, by steps of one, you automatically also survive um, counting by, 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 by any other step as well. And so um, these functions um, intuitively would give you the best chance of survival. Because it, it robs your, your torture of any of any uh, choice um, in some sense. Um, so, okay. So if if this sequence had bounded sums, if 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 if, if, this, if the sums here were bounded, then then we would be fine. Um, okay. But uh, well, actually, no. We, we, well, okay. The, the the solution would be negative. Actually, that that uh, that uh, you would not uh, um, that. Uh, um, that you you get a sequence of bounded discrepancy, um, but it turns out that that um, that these sums actually do go to infinity. Okay, so the, the if, you, if you take the partial sums of this function, they they actually um, become unbounded, um, and that actually is a very interesting um, series. If, if you actually sum this series, okay, so here's a graph of of of, 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 of the partial sum. So like, uh, um, if you sum the first one thousand elements of, of the sequence, you get something like minus thirty or something. Um, so it fluctuates um, and. Uh, you notice it fluctuates in a in a fairly oscillatory pattern. There, there are sinusoidal waves here, um, and the frequencies of these sine patterns are actually connected to the um, um, the zeros of the of the Riemann zeta function. As it turns out, uh, it, it's connected to a, a very important uh, object in number theory, um, and uh, yeah. So um, and using facts about um, the zeta function, which, which is this mysterious object in number theory, you can show that this sequence becomes unbounded. Okay, so, so it is known um, basically because we, um, we know that there's at least one zero of the zeta function on the critical line. Uh, th that gives you a lower bound. It shows you that this expression can be as large as the square root of k. Um, we would dearly love to also get an upper bound I would, um, to prove that, the, that this, 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 uh, this sum never gets much bigger than square root of k. That's actually the equivalent of the Riemann hypothesis. If you can prove that, then you can prove the Riemann hypothesis. So we can't do that at all. 
But, but anyway, uh, this is connected to, to, to the Riemann hypothesis. And this is, this is one of the reasons why Erdős posed this question, because so he found this, this purely combinatorial question, which, which potentially could have some, some impact on, on number theory. Um, although, as it turns out, um, the, the way things worked ended up the other way. So we actually had to um, wait for advances in number theory before we could solve this problem, and, rather than the other way around. But you, know, it's, it, it's, um, you never know until you actually solve the problem which way the mathematics will go. OK. Um, now, there's another, okay, so the, the Dirichlet characters were, were one example of a potential counterexample to, to this problem from number theory. Um, there's another important type of, 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 uh, of potential counterexample uh, from number theory uh, called Dirichlet characters. Um, so Dirichlet characters are also multiplicative functions like the Luma function, uh, but they have a, an additional property of being periodic. They repeat themselves. Um, and so, so they show up a lot in, 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 in um, in number theory too. So, um, okay, so there's a formal definition, but may I just give you an example? So, um, an example of Dirichlet characters is called chi three. Um, so, it's it's the function which is um, it, it happens between plus one, minus one, and zero. You're plus one if you're uh, one modulo three. You're minus one if you're two modulo three, and you're zero if you're zero modulo three. So, it's a sequence that does this. Okay, so uh, this sequence is also completely multiplicative. So if you want to sum any, uh, uh, by, if it's sum by skips, it, it suffices to just to, to, to just sum the partial sums. But here the partial sums are always bounded. If if, if you sum this um, the series, you, you always get one zero zero one zero zero. You only get, ever get one or zero. So this sequence has has bounded discrepancy. Okay, so in, if you, if, no matter how you skip count, this sequence always is bounded. Um, but it is not a counterexample to the problem because there are some zeros in here. Okay? So this sequence is not a pure plus one, minus one sequence. Uh, there are some zeros. Um, and you're not allowed to use zeros. Of course, the question is a lot easier if you're allowed to use zeros. You have to pick zero, 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 and you have no discrepancy. But, okay. but, it's, a, but it's a sequence which has sort of two thirds plus or minus one and, two -third, and only one third zero. And it, it, it is a, a count, it, um, and it almost is a counterexample. And there are other examples like this where instead of one third of the numbers being zero, maybe one eleventh of the numbers are zero, or, or some really tiny fraction. So, um, you, you, what this example shows you is that there are sequences that are very, very close to being counterexamples. That there are sequences that are almost entirely plus minus ones with a few zeros. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, if 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 the torturer grants you um, the ability to stay still every now and then, <laughs> um, but not very often, it, then you can survive basically. Okay. Um, but th the proportion of, of zeros you can make as small as you wish. Um, okay, so this is another potential counter. Well, this itself is not a counterexample, but it's, it's conceivable that you could modify this example somehow to make a real counterexample. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, uh, um, so in fact, uh, yeah. So um, th there are ways to do there are ways to do this. So um, yeah. So the simplest thing to do is that. Uh, uh, whenever you multiply three, uh, where you're zero here, you just you just divide by three until you until you're not in multiple three, and, and then you use uh, uh, you, um, uh, you use the sequence you had before. So um, yeah, so you, you you could fill in um, so three is three times one, so you can put a plus one here. Six is three times two. You can fill in the sequence, for example, just just by factoring out all, all the threes. Um, and if you do that, you get a sequence which, which is now only purely plus minus one. Um, and it was observed by Boan, Choi, and Kuhns a few years ago that this sequence almost works to disprove the discrepancy, the, the, uh, discrepancy problem. If, if, you, if you sum the sequence uh, up to some length k, it will only ever fluctuate by at most the logarithm of k. It, it goes very, very slowly. In fact, the, the, the sum of the first k numbers is exactly the same as the number of ones in the base three decimal expansion of, uh, of k, as it turns out. Um, so it, it goes very, very slowly, which is consistent with this numerical data. You know, like we, we, we have this sequence of length 1,100, which only has this discrepancy of two, and then this, this sequence of 13,000, it's discrepancy of three. You know, it really does look like a, a, lo a logarithmic growth. Uh, and so th this sort of construction gives you something which, which looks like um, logarithmic growth. So these are near counterexamples. It, 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 what it tells you is that the most dangerous sequences, the sequences which, which could come closest to being bounded discrepancy, are, are somehow related to these Dirichlet characters. Okay, so 
I wasn't the first to work on this problem by any means. Um, so actually, um, there was a, um, a big attempt to crowdsource a solutions problem back in 2010. Um, so Timothy Gowers, uh, who's a friend of mine actually, um, also a Fields medalist, uh, he, uh, um, yeah, so, so he pioneered these, these uh, sort of a, an experimental way of solving math mathematical problems called uh, polymath projects. So, um, you know, so the usual style of mathematics is you get one or two or five people working together, maybe at a blackboard, you know, you, and um, you don't, you know, you, you, you share among yourselves all the partial results that, that you, you get, but you don't share, you don't tell other, pe other people what you've done until you, you, you finish and you write your paper and you only see the final product. Um, so the, um, the idea of the polymath was to do the, the opposite. So you, you would get, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people in principle, in, in, in practice really dozens, but um, you get a lot of people on the internet um, working on the problem. But uh, the key thing is that um, it's, it's, it's not a race where everyone sort of, um, you know, works secretly on their own until they have a full solution and they, they post it. If they even have just some, a, a thought, you know, uh, could we try this uh, or something? Um, and they would put it on, in some public place. There'll be some forum, like a blog or a, a wiki or, or some, some, some or discussion group or something. And um, you know, you would throw out something, and then someone else would say, "Ah, that probably doesn't work because of this." Okay, or, and some, or someone would say, oh, "But if you try this, then maybe this will work." And so, the, this, uh, this whole sequence of, of, of small little steps uh, to try to to, uh, to attack the problem, um, and it's 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 a, it's a fun way of doing mathematics. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, although, even if you don't solve the original problem, um, these these projects that you often get um, um, you often get a deep understanding of why you didn't solve the problem and what needs what is missing in order to, to actually um, to, uh, to continue. Um, so they worked on this for about two years. I participated actually in, in some of it, um, and they they they, uh, they worked on many things actually. Um, but uh, um, but one thing which they did um, um, succeed in doing was that they made a reduction, which didn't, didn't solve the problem, but it uh, um, but it, but it simplified the problem. So I told you that these complete morphological sequences were the enemy that these, these were some of the, the worst sequences. And they actually managed to prove that in some sense they were. Um, and roughly speaking, what they showed was that if you wanted to prove this, this, uh, solve this problem, you only needed to check the multiplicative sequences. Okay? All the other sequences would follow um, if you could do the multiplicative ones. Um, and so there's a very nice argument, which is actually based on Fourier analysis, which you, know, you break up an arbitrary sequence into, into multiplicative sequences. But uh, it turns out that, that, the, uh, that really you just need to understand the multiplicative sequences and you just need to understand whether, given any multiplicative sequence, whether the, um, the partial sums are unbounded or not. So that's, that was a big simplification. Um, but at that point, they encountered severe number theory theoretic difficulties, and, and, and uh, they got stuck. All right. Um, so yeah, so it turns out that there's two types of multiplicative functions. There are multiplicative functions that look like Dirichlet characters, and there are ones that don't. Uh, and there's, there's a way to, to measure this. And, they were able to, uh, to un the polymath project were, were able to, to understand the ones that did look like they were like characters, and those ones they could eventually show were unbounded. But th the ones that did not look like they were like characters, they did not have any tools. And so, um, so for example, the Louisville function, you know, so um, the partial sums of the Louisville function, um, we know they're unbounded because of this deep connecting to the zeta function and, and, and the Riemann hypothesis. Um, but that's a connection that only works for this one particular function. And there are many, many other multiplicative functions out there. So what one would like is to, one would like another way to understand the partial sums of, of, this, um, of this sequence that didn't use um, so much um, the theory of the zeta function, because that would hopefully cover the rest of the cases. But at the, at the time, uh, there was not enough uh, number theory to, to do that. Um, and so the project got stuck and eventually uh, uh, disbanded. Why didn't it disband? It just would ground to a halt. I mean, all the records are still there. This is one of the great things about the Polymath project. And it was actually a great resource for me when I was working on the project later to look at all the partial results that, that the Polymath project had. OK. So you know, the, the Louvre function is connected to the prime numbers. And um, we don't understand the prime numbers nearly as well as, as we would like. Um, you know, so even very basic questions about the prime numbers are still, are still unsolved. Uh, one of my favorite questions about the prime numbers is the um, the twin prime conjecture, that there should be infinitely many primes, p, um, pairs of primes, which are, just, uh, which are separated by two, like three and five, and 11 and 13. And we can't do that. Um, so, um, but the Louvre function is 
better than the primes because it, 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 I mean, it, it involves, you, know, you need the primes to define it. It's, it's, the, the primes are involved in this definition, but oh, I've erased it. But, but you do have this extra little property of, of multiplicativity being multiplicative. And this is something you can use. Um, I mean, the primes are in some sense have some multiplicative properties. If you multiply two primes together, you'll get a non-prime. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a limit, a severe limit, what you can do with that sort of information. But with um, with uh, with the Luber function, you can you can you can get somewhere. So, for example, here's a fairly simple thing you can say about the Luber function: that um, that um, it's it's not so easy to show that this, the partial sums are bounded. But I can at least tell you that there's lots of consecutive pairs where the values are the same. For example, five and six have the same value of the Luber function. Nine and ten have the same value of the Luber function. So I can at least give you lots and lots of pairs where you're both plus one plus or both plus minus one. If you like, it's kind of like a twin prime conjecture for the Luber function. But it's much, much easier to prove. Um, and the proof is actually a original principle type thing. Um, so it's, 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 it's more combinatorics. Um, so the proof is actually fairly simple. So you take two numbers n and n plus 1, okay, and, you, and you, look, you look at the, the Luber function. Yeah. So either these are the same, or they're either they're both plus one, or they're both, or, or um, they're different. One, one is plus one, one is minus one. Okay, so if they're if they're both plus one, then you're done. You, you've you've found a pair which is the same. And they're both minus one, then you're done. But the the problem is if 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 they disagree. If 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 one of them is plus one, one of them is minus one. But if uh, if the Luber function is plus one at n, then at two n, it has to be minus one. Okay, because you have one more prime factor. And if, if your Luber function is minus 1 at n plus 1, then at twice n plus 1, which is 2 n plus 2, you have to be plus 1. Okay? And then, so, and then you, in, in between, you have 2 n plus 1. And this number is either plus or minus 1, but, but which, whichever one it is, there, there has to be a match. Uh, either you get a match over here or a match over here. Okay? So by using these sort of you know, ad hoc arguments, you can start saying something about, about the, uh, the Luber function. Okay? So th this is fairly weak. This, this doesn't give you anywhere near enough information to, uh, to, to control the discrepancy, but, it, but it, 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 it at least gives you hope you can do something. Um, so you might think, okay, so you know, this was fairly easy. You might think, uh, okay, so there's the, there's the opposite question. Can you, can you show um, infinitely many pairs where, where the sign differs? Okay, so plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, and so forth. Can, can, you, find, can you find lots and lots of, of pairs where the uh, lots of sign changes of the Lua function? So this turns out to be actually a much harder question. Um, so it, it's, it's not hard to show that there's infinitely many sign changes, but to show that there's a sort of a positive proportion, that the sign changes happen some, some positive fraction of the time. This was actually a really hard question. Um, and um, at the time of the polymath project, it was actually unknown. Um, and the consensus was if even this was unknown, there's, there was sort of no way we could do anything harder. Um, so it was only in 2015 that um, that uh, there was a breakthrough in, in number theory where people, um, by um, two number theorists, uh, Kaiser Matamaki and Maxime Radziwill, um, who managed to understand the sort of the local fluctuations of, of, of things like the Luber function much, much better. Um, so the actual result they proved is, is a little bit technical, but, um, but one of the things they showed, for example, is that, is that, there were, um, that, there were, um, that sign changes occurred of a positive fraction of the time. Um, and so th this, this um, Okay, so this was a breakthrough. Um, so w when this first came out, this came out like January of 2015. So um, lots of number theorists got excited. I got excited in, in, in this. And in fact, I started working with Kaiser and, uh, and with Maxime on, uh, on some other problems involving um, the Luber function. Um, and uh, I, I, I rewrote a paper and we published it on, or, and, and I wrote about it on, on, on my blog. Um, and, um, it involves sort of these, uh, um, um, some of these games like this, where, where you, you, you have some sign patterns and you, and you, and, and you, you again play this sort of Sudoku type game, where if this is plus one, this is minus one, and so on and so forth. Um, and I commented on my blog that, uh, that uh, writing this paper was felt like solving a Sudoku puzzle. Um, and then I got this blog comment um, saying that, you know, I was in the, working on the Polymath 5 project, and we were also you know, what we were doing also felt like solving Sudoku puzzles. You know? So um, could it be that, that, this, that the, what you are working on has any bearing on, 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 the, on the discrepancy problem? 
Um, I can, and my first reaction, which is still on my blog, actually, says, no, no way. Um, okay, there's a technical reason. So you know, we were proving upper bounds for these things, and, 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 and the uh, discovery one was a question about lower bounds, and I thought that no technique for proving upper bounds could prove lower bounds. It was a very naive question, comment. Okay, but then I came back the next day, I thought about it, and says, actually, uh, I was probably wrong. There was probably some connection. Um, and so I, I got interested again in, uh, uh, in this discrepancy problem. And, uh, yeah, and actually, yeah, within, within a few weeks, I actually found that, that there was a way to use uh, this result of Matamaki and Ratsubo to actually finish off the question. Um, so, yeah, it's the actual proof, unfortunately, is too technical for this sort of, of audience. But, um, right, but basically, um, you, you, you can run arguments like this. Okay, so, so, so this argument gives you um, some, uh, some control on, 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 on how the, um, um, on, on how the Lua function fluctuates. And, uh, and it used just the uh, multiplicativity using powers of two, um, uh, multiplicativity at, at, uh, uh, involving the prime two. You could try similar things involving three and five, and, and, th and this is what actually my original paper with Kaiser and, and Max did. But then you could just keep throwing more and more primes. You, you, you could keep using multiplicativity at, at, at different primes, and, and you get more and more complicated combinatorics. But what you can show after a fair bit of work is, is that um, any, um, if you use all, all these multiplicative properties, you must eventually get enough fluctuation to get, to get unbounded sums unless there is some, um, something like, uh, unless your sequence be behaves a little bit like a periodic sequence. Okay, so, so there are, um, okay, uh, um, So we, 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 we had this, this previous sequence, lambda uh, chi 3, where the, where the partial sums are always bounded. Okay? And basically, the reason why they stay bounded is because they repeat periodically, and also because they mean 0. So it's, it's because of this periodicity. They always come back. Um, they, that they, they, that, uh, that um, the value depends pretty much only on, on, on what they're doing modulo 3. Right? Because of this periodicity, this is what creates um, bounded sums. And uh, what you can show, uh, very roughly speaking, is, is that this sort of periodicity is the only way in which you, you can create bounded sums. That, 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 if, that if, if your sequence has bounded fluctuations, um, it must be because it is very biased. Um, and, um, um, it, it oscillates in some periodic fashion. So, for example, it, 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 um, it is much more likely to be plus 1 for numbers that are 1 mod 3 than, than, than numbers that are 2 mod 3. That there, there is some sort of there's some sort of um, bias or correlation between the, the, the behavior of this function and um, what your last digit is, base 3 or base 7 or, or base uh, some other prime. Uh, and uh, the best way to actually capture, the, to, write, to formalize this actually it comes from information theory. Um, so there's actually a concept called, called mutual information. If you, if you have two random variables, uh, you can, there's, a, there's a number called the mutual information that measures how much these two random variables are correlated. Um, and it turns out this, this is the perfect uh, tool um, that, uh, um, yeah, that you can show that, that, the, that your sums will be unbounded unless there is a lot of mutual information between the Louisville function, which you can think of as sort of a, a, a random sequence of, of signs or pseudo-random sequence of signs, and um, the behavior of, the numbers, uh, of, of your number base 3 or base 4 or base, base some, other, um, some, some other base. Okay, so you, 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 can, uh, um, you can solve the problem unless there is a, a lot of... Uh, uh, bias between the Lua function and um, and um, and some base and some 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 uh, some some local information, some base n information. Um, now, I was not able to actually prevent this mutual information from happening. So this mutual information is like a conspiracy. And um, one thing about number theory is that anything you want to be true, there's always potentially a sort of a conspiracy in between the numbers to prevent it from being true, like. It could be that we eventually run out of twin prime numbers because there's some conspiracy between adjacent numbers that, that every time n decides to be prime, there's a secret pact of n plus 2 that n plus 2 will not be prime. And we can't rule out these conspiracies. Conspiracy theories are very hard to debunk. But what you can do, but what we can do, the reason we can make any progress at all in the subject, really, is because while you can never really disprove one conspiracy theory, um, um, many cons conspiracy theories are inconsistent with each other. So you can't have many, many conspiracies happening at the same time. Um, and so um, 
it could be possible, for example, that, that uh, the Lua function exhibits severe bias depending on what your number is doing mod 7. And it could be possible that, that it's biased depending on what it's doing mod 11 and so forth. But it turns out that it can't be biased simultaneously in all these. Um, there's, there's just not enough information content in the entire, uh, in, in the Lua sequence to somehow spread information among all these sort of independent, uh, to be biased in, in, in all these independently different ways. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, th this you can make precise using something called, called uh, the, the Shannon uh, uh, information inequalities. But you c yeah, what you can find is that uh, is that you know if, if um, among all the primes in the world, there must be some primes which are which are unbiased with res respect to the Lua function. The Lua function cannot be simultaneously biased with respect to every single prime. Um, and so you can find some good primes where there is no bias. And for like. For those good primes, these sort of arguments in using multiplicity actually start working, um, and then so 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 then then you can actually choose, uh, um, yeah. So then your sequence behaves randomly enough that you can then use torsion probability to show that the uh, the sequence actually becomes unbounded. Um, okay, and this kills off all the multiplicative functions um, except for the Dirichlet characters, which are the ones that that are biased. Okay, so there's there's still some which for which this argument doesn't work, but the previous polymath project did. Uh, finish off that case, and so, and so all the multiplicative functions are under control. And then the polymath project also showed that once you can prove that once you can control the multiplicative functions, you can control all you can control all sequences. And so putting all that together, uh, this, this 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 is how 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 the problem was solved. Yeah. So yeah, it, 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 yeah. The, yeah. So it was a really unexpected in use of information theory okay, at the end that, that made the whole thing work, which I'm hoping is, is going to be a tool that we use more often in the subject. Okay, this, um, it's a really beautiful um, part of mathematics. Okay, so I think I will end there. Thank you very much.